Hi there, welcome to IndyCar. Uh, it is actually the 5th of July today. I think I said it was the 5th the other day. Sorry about that, but you know me in dates. Anyway, today is the 5th of July, uh, the day after American Independence Day, which um, for some strange reason I neglected to mention yesterday. But anyway, happy Independence Day to America. Anyway, back to Scotland and its own Independence Day, or rather lack of it at the moment. The national newspaper in Scotland has carried several stories recently uh, about the actions of what I would say as key figures in the independence movement and several uh, key figures in the independence movement are actually doing something about independence. Now, uh, you've heard me criticising the Scottish Government on numerous occasions for lack of clarity on what is happening with regards to the independence referendum. And if you look at social media or, in fact, any other media today, um, you will see no mention of it. But you will see countless pages about COVID, countless pages about how improvements are being made to Scotland by the SNP, about how different uh, benefits are now being paid to help people out of poverty, all of which is excellent stuff but doesn't answer the fundamental questions which many of us won't answer, which is what is happening about the move to an independence referendum. Well, you know this story, if um, if it's not happening, then you've got to make it happen yourself. And two people stand out for me this week as having done exactly that. The first one is El Elliot Bulmer. Now, Elliot Bulmer, for those of you who don't know him, was one of the first men in Scotland to write a constitution for the Scottish state. And Elliot Bulmer has for many years believed, rightly in my opinion, that the first building block of any new country is a written constitution. Now, I've mentioned constitutions before as well in this context, particularly the one written by Dr. Mark McNaught from the University of Wren, um, with whom I have a fairly good relationship and over the years we have worked together on refining his own version of the Scottish Constitution, which incidentally is in the safekeeping of Mike Russell, who is currently, as far as I know, the Scottish Government's uh, main man for organising the independence referendum. Anyway, back to that later on. So Elliot Bulmer has been published in the press this week, in the national newspaper, saying that he felt that it was high time that the Scottish Government uh, both proposed and adopted a Scottish constitution in the Scottish Parliament, Holyrood. Now the reasons for this are many and varied, but the first one, I think, and the most important one, is that you can't really have a state unless it has a constitution, a foundation upon which to build it. Now we have some founding documents, as you're probably aware, we've got the 1320 Abroad Declaration, in which for the first time uh, all of Scotland basically said to the rest of the world that Scotland is an independent state and it will be defended in, uh, in that particular instance against invasion from England. And, um, and that was taken as being one of the very first uh, such declarations ever made actually by any country. So Scotland was probably one of the first uh, in the world to make such a declaration. <coughs> Anyway, uh, as well as that, we also have the Bill of Right, or the Claim of Right, I beg your pardon, the Claim of Right, which also reinforces our right as a country to choose the form of government which best suits our needs. And this is a guarantee which has been agreed by Westminster. So that means that Scotland is both a country and has the right to choose what form of government it wants. Now, that is a very broad uh statement because it can encompass anything. It could encompass home rule, it could encompass uh, a kind of Devo Max, it could encompass staying in the Union, or of course it could encompass full independence, the return of all powers to Holyrood. So we have the right to do that. The trouble is that that right is basically being denied us by the Westminster government and by all of the Westminster parties who do not want to see the Union ended. So what do we do about it? Well, there are two things. Obviously, the first one is to have a constitution. Now, let's be clear here. You can have a written constitution for a country, even if it's in a union with another country, which we are. But Scotland is not, uh, is not a region of the United Kingdom. It is a country in a union with England. It's a very important distinction here that Scotland never ever gave up its identity as a country, as a nation in its own right, and it still has that identity. The problem is getting international uh, organisations such as the United Nations, the Council of Europe, European Union, and many others 
to recognise that fact because it's been very cleverly obscured by the British state for decades. The British state has uh, been regarded, particularly by the European Union, as a unitary state, which of course it isn't. It's a binary state. It's a state with two members, Scotland and England. Both Northern Ireland and Wales are actually not nations in their own right, according to the definition. Wales is a principality which was basically conquered by England and became a principality of England. That's why you have the Prince of Wales. Northern Ireland, uh, by contrast, is, I, I suppose, just six counties. It's a province, as the Romans used to call it. It's not a country, it's a bit of conquered ground which the British state claims ownership to. So Scotland and England are basically equals in terms of nation states. But the problem is that we don't get this recognition and for some bizarre reason we seem to be faced with having to prove that we have the right to hold the referendum whether we stay in this union or not. There are many ways around this, but one of the fundamental things is if you want to convince people uh, of the merits of independence and that Scotland should be independent, one of the first things you need to do is show them what the new state will be. And the best way to do that is to describe it in a constitution, because a constitution is a description of the country. It, it basically defines the boundaries of both behaviour, it, it, it basically lays out the expectations uh, of behaviour for all of its citizens. It tells citizens what their rights are, what they're entitled to, what they're entitled to do, what their freedoms are, but it also tells them what their restrictions are under the law, what they may not do, and more importantly it describes the responsibilities and the powers of elected officials in Scotland, that means MSPs, councillors and ministers. And because it does that, it describes very uh, succinctly and very accurately what the new state will be, how it will be governed. It will be a democracy. It will be uh, not necessarily uh, um, a monarchy. It doesn't need to be a monarchy. We can have a referendum about retaining the monarchy if we want to. But basically you have to start out as an independent republic and then have a referendum on whether you want to keep uh, some kind of figurehead related to the royal family or whether you want to elect one. All of these things would be described in the constitution, none of which incidentally stops us from remaining in the Union, because you can have a constitution for Scotland and still be in the Union. It doesn't affect independence at all, and it doesn't affect the status of the Union at all. But what it does do is once you've described what this new state will be, uh, and what the rules and responsibilities are, what the powers are, who owns the natural resources of Scotland, how those natural resources must be used for the benefit of the inhabitants of the country, and Things like who pays the pensions, what the currency is, what the national anthem should be, what the flag of the nation should be, all of those things which are normal in every other country in the world except Scotland would be in a constitution. Now having said that, once you've got a constitution and it has been debated and amended and altered and changed and agreed to in Holyrood, it would have to be passed by a majority of MSPs. Now once it was in position, this uh, constitution would set out exactly what the new independent state would look like. It wouldn't be based on promises or vague assertions or a wish list. It's not going to be like the white paper was in 2014. It's a guarantee. When you have a constitution, it's a legal document. It's the founding legal document which encompasses all of the laws of the country. So no party uh, who adopts a constitution can stray outside of it. And that would mean that the SNP would not need to make promises about what they were going to do uh, after independence, because it wouldn't be their responsibility. It would be the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament to decide what the responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament were and what the new state would be. For example, let's say that individuals have the right to, uh, let's say, suitable and uh, adequate accommodation. Just for talking sake, everybody is entitled to a home which suits their needs. Everybody is entitled to nourishing food, everybody is entitled to fresh clean water. All of the basic essentials of life can be written into a constitution at the beginning. 
all of people's human rights can be guaranteed in a constitution and you could adopt the international uh, human rights laws of the UN into Scots law and into your constitution from the outset. And the British government's not going to like this. They're not going to like it one bit. But on the plus side, even if you can't enact all of the things in the constitution while you're in the union, what it does is it shows what can't be done under the union. Because if a constitution promises that the pensions are going to be approximately the average of a European pension, in other words, twice what the miserly British state pays, then the only way that pensioners are going to get that kind of pension is if they vote for independence in a referendum afterwards. But the nice thing about the constitution is it guarantees that. Guarantees it enshrined in Scots law at the Scottish Parliament. And that means that no party is responsible for that promise. The entire Parliament is responsible for that promise. And that takes away the, the whole it's Nicola Sturgeon's independence, or it's the SNP's independence. It makes it Scotland's independence. And this is an important thing about a constitution. It brings all of the country together. And it means that this constitution is not just for a party. These are not just promises made by a party before an election. These are guarantees written into law. And that means that anybody who votes for independence will know exactly what the country is going to be like and what their rights and entitlements and responsibilities and laws are going to be. So right from the beginning, although we wouldn't be independent with this uh, new constitution, it would guarantee everything that the new state promises. And because of that, when you have a referendum, nobody could say, oh, well, you never told me that, because it would be written, basically carved in blocks of stone that could never be unwritten. The interesting thing about the Constitution also is that the politicians uh, and the academics and the rest of us who examine this Constitution and finally enact it and adopt it in Parliament would have to make sure that the rules that were made were livable with, that we could live within them. Because when politicians create a Constitution, they're creating a, a rod for their own back. They're creating limitations on what they may do, and it limits the powers of ministers and the powers of a prime or first minister about what they are allowed to do, how they wield that power, and how they can be removed from power if they misbehave. At the moment, the British state has none of that, and that is why we are stuck with ludicrous, incompetent fools that are running England at the moment, and vice versa because we are attached to England at the moment through the Union, they're running us as well. So, Elliot Bulmer is correct. We need a constitution and we need it right now, before we have a vote for independence. Because one of the biggest selling points that you have for independence is the constitution guarantees everything. It's not the SNP guaranteeing it, and it's not the Green Party, it's not me and you, it's the entire parliament and the entire country having reviewed this document agrees that these are what the rules should be. This is what the new state should look like. So it's very important that we do this now. And I honestly am baffled as to why Mike Russell has not even put forward uh, Mark Russell's or Elliot Bulmer's um, two versions of constitutions to uh, the floor of the House at Holyrood and said, we have these constitutions, we are going to debate these, and we maybe combine the best elements of both and come up with a constitution which we can agree on uh, in majority here in this chamber and adopt as the Scottish constitution thereafter. Then we will have a referendum on independence to see how much of this constitution cannot be done under the union and how all of it can be done with independence. And this is the key. I'm surprised Mike Russell has not acted on this yet. This doesn't make any difference to COVID whatsoever. This particular piece of um, political work can be done right now. It can be adopted in Holyrood. It doesn't need a public vote to adopt it, although you could have a referendum on this as well, I guess, if you really wanted to go to the trouble. But it doesn't actually need it. Um, I've read a bit of Elliot Bulmer's constitution. I haven't read all of it, I'll have to be honest. I've read all of Dr. Mark McNaught's constitution and it's an absolute beezer of a constitution. So I can say that both men's work is excellent 
And I see no reason why uh, the SNP and the Greens and many other parties couldn't debate this in Holyrood and decide on amending it, putting it together so that it makes some sense into something that everybody can live with and then adopt it. No problem at all with that. It doesn't affect COVID restrictions whatsoever. We don't have to have a vote on it. We don't have to have people marching in the streets for it. It just needs to be done. Second thing, uh, Mike Fennick, who's also a very well-known and um, long-term independent campaigner. I met Mike many years ago on the campaign trail. And Mike Fennick was one of the first people uh, to actively promote a Scottish currency. But Mike's gone a stage further this week, uh, and it's been carried on the front pages of the National today, that uh, Mike Fennick has taken the last part of the uh, Declaration of Our Growth from 1320, the part which says, so long as 100 of us remain alive, we shall never be brought uh, under the rule of the English king. Now, it's, I'm paraphrasing, but this... This symbolic uh, mention of as long as 100 of us are still alive uh, will not permit ourselves to be brought under the control of the English monarch is important because what Mike has decided to do is to rewrite a new declaration, a declaration which states that Scots have the right to hold an independence referendum at any time of their choosing and they don't need permission to do it. And he's seeking 100 signatories from pro-independence campaigners of all stripes, uh, with which he is then going to present to the United Nations as Scotland's demand for self-determination. Now you may know that the United Nations Charter guarantees self-determination for people anywhere in the world, and Scotland as an 800 or more year old country with its own identity and its own declaration of independence in 1320 should have no trouble at all with accepting uh, the demand of the 100 signatories that Scotland be allowed to hold a referendum. What Mike is doing here is trying to go over the heads of the British state and go directly to the heads of all the other states in the United Nations and say, look here, Scotland is demanding the right to have a vote on independence. The English government is saying that it's not allowed to do that, that it's going to veto, it's not going to agree to it. We need you to say that Scotland has the right to self-determination and it has a perfect right to hold a referendum at any time it likes. Now this kicks the ball out of the local ballpark here in the UK into the world of global politics and brings attention to Scotland from all of these other states. Over 150 of them uh, in the United Nations the last time I looked. I think, if I remember correctly, there's 129 nations in the UN, plus there are the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, of which the UK is one. So by doing this, um, what Mike is doing is seeking to ratify our right to self-determination from a higher body than the English government. And I think this is a good idea, because with Britain now seeking international trade deals with virtually anybody who will agree to such a thing, to have all of the countries of the United Nations saying, ah, oh, but you can't be doing trade deals until you let the Scots have their independence referendum, it does put a huge stick through the spokes of the Brexit bicycle. And personally, I think what Mike is trying to do is, although it's highly symbolic, it also creates a big media stir outside of Scotland. Now, remember I mentioned to you that in November, there's going to be this big COP26 um, Council of Parties uh, on climate change coming to Glasgow and the media circus which is going to come into town from the south is going to try and take over the whole of Glasgow and make it seem like it is just covered in union flags. But at that conference there will be hundreds of foreign media journalists, not to mention camera crews, reporters, the works. So it's very important for us at that point to have got these hundred signatories and to have got a response from the United Nations so that the world leaders who are coming to Glasgow know full well that Scotland has asked the United Nations to say to the United Kingdom, you really have to let the Scots have this independence referendum and you're not going to get away with not doing it. We're all coming to COP26 as well. 
having all of these events happening simultaneously this year, I think, makes it impossible to have a referendum this year. But as I've said many, many times before, if we vote a constitution in at Holyrood right now and adopt it in time for COP26, now that would be fantastic. If we could get our constitution ratified and accepted into Scots law before that, I know it's a bit of a tall order, but if it could be done, it would be hugely symbolic. And also get the recognition of the 100 signatories demanding self-determination for Scotland from the UN at the same point. It puts gigantic pressure on Boris Johnson and his cronies in London to stop all this nonsense of saying no to a Section 30 order and to just shut up and let us get on with it. There are many paths to independence, but with the SNP mired in COVID at the moment and seemingly unable uh, to make any inroads towards independence by itself, having people like Mike Fennick and Elliot Bulmer and to some extent uh, Dr Mark McNaught, who is still running his campaign for the Constitution. It creates a buzz and it creates more interest in what can be done as a new independent state. We need to stop thinking of ourselves as part of the UK and start thinking of ourselves as Scotland, as a country, and stop basically just sitting there and letting things happen to us. There are more ways of getting independence than relying on politicians. If you relied on politicians to do everything, nothing would get done. Nicola Sturgeon was uh, or appeared via remote link at the uh, the big summit in Austria, at which she made a very good speech about how Scotland is taking action on climate change, not just making noises and saying that it's it's very bad and we really should do something about it. But she has said that you know we're halfway there to our um, our carbon reduction target, but the last part of it, the last fifty percent of it, is going to be very very difficult indeed. It means that people are going to have to accept quite hard changes to their lives in big ways. But that also has to be part of the new constitution, that Scotland has to write into its constitution that the, the country is going to run a net zero carbon economy. That means basically that we do not emit uh, more carbon than can be removed from the atmosphere in Scotland by things like trees, by uh, peatlands, by the sea. And having that worked out and having that in written into the Constitution is another guarantee that it will happen. So all of these things coming together at the same time is important, but it's important first of all that the SNP listens to what is happening, listens to people like Elliot Bulmer, listens to Dr Mark McNaught, and listens to the 100 individuals whom uh, Mike Fennick is getting together to sign this document to send to the United Nations. Most of us are probably unaware that the Scottish Parliament owes its existence not to the Labour Party, in fact not to the British state really, but to a group of individuals who went to the Council of Nations from Scotland, a set of patriots went to the Council of Nations and made representations to them saying that it was high time that Scotland had its own Parliament, that it should not uh, be allowed to be a participant at the time in the European Union unless it gave at least some political autonomy to Scotland and gave it its own working parliament. And I think to a large extent the Labour Party was forced to accept that there should be a Scottish parliament. There was a 73% vote for it in a referendum. People wanted the Scottish parliament and we got it. But it's a parliament without enough powers. To get enough powers it needs a constitution which will tell people what the full powers of the state can do. And as I say, with that information in hand, then people, when they do vote for independence, will know exactly what they're going to get. It's not going to be arm waving, it's not going to be pretty pictures, it's not going to be promises or pledges. It's guaranteed, written in law, and it's going to be there from the beginning because if the Constitution's already written before independence is voted on, it's guaranteed. Anyway, that's it from me. I'm off my soapbox for the rest of the day. If you have any comments about the content of today's program, please contact me in the usual way. Um, but as I say, read the article about by Elliot Bulmer and also read the work of Dr. Mark McNaught. And if you can get a hold of it online, Mark McNaught's constitution is available uh, to access online. 
Anyway, that's it for me today. Hopefully I'll see you all tomorrow, but um, the weather seems to be drying up a bit here in Glasgow. Let's hope that uh, we have a dry spell before the next deluge. Anyway, I'll see you soon. Have a good day. Bye-bye.